the orcs, right? They're the bad guys, who gives a shit? We just hack and slash and we loot their dead bodies, right? Hack and slash, kill them all, you know, conquer the infidels. Boy, that campaign sounds like a barrel of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> I am Pardieu, I am a holy man. I'm the king of France. Your majesty. As somebody who's, who's opening a refrigerator and leaning in, right, is the language of a woman. Somebody who's opening the refrigerator and being cut off halfway through that lean is the voice of a, like a mermaid or a siren. Right? Zardoz speaks to you. This is not the face of the hobby anymore. Uh, and I think there's been mistakes made in years past where people assumed that D&D players were all, you know, white dudes in a basement. Um, which is which has been a faulty assumption for a lot of years and gets more and more false every day. Uh, and so it's, in my viewpoint, honestly, guys like me can't can't leave soon enough. We've got to put a little hot sauce on the taco, you know what I mean? We want this dwarf to be the dwarfiest dwarf. Right, right, right. We right. want the elf to be the elfiest elf. And just the dashiest dash of Tabasco. <laughs> Their voices need to carry across water. I'm a creative. Um, it's a huge drain, right? Because fans can be awful. You say white lives matter, they don't. White lives don't matter because white lives aren't a thing. I disagree. I disagree, Gary. Lutherville, Marina Del X, Otisburg. Otisburg. Who's Tess Monster? She's got her own place. Man. Otisburg. It's a little bitty place. Otisburg. Okay. I just wipe it off. That's all. It's a little town. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Fucking thing sucks. In five, four, three. Great. Great sandwich. Thank you. I enjoyed having you here. You're a very good co-host. Howdy, howdy, howdy. How's everybody doing? Hey, I am a white dude in a basement. What do you think he meant by that? By that wise crack? Huh. It's a basement of a house that I own. How are you guys doing today? Already got a nice little crowd. Off night. You know, it's not our usual Wednesday. We're going, we're going back to back. This is three streams in five days. <laughs> I got to say, it's a, it's a little, uh, little tiring, but uh, I am here for you guys. Um, and uh, of course, we're all here to celebrate Dr. Greg Gillespie's Dragon Slayer RPG. Hopefully, we will also have a third person joining us, and I owe a public apology to him. I originally had planned to have DM James on last night uh, through a series of events, uh, not intentional, um, mainly due to my uh, airheadedness, uh, just being flustered and having uh, Max on at the last minute. Um, I completely did not see him. He was in the up, the bottom box on StreamYard, as any streamer will know. Uh, so my my public apologies to uh, DM James. We chatted about it. He's fine because he's a really cool dude. I invited him here so he can throw in uh, if he wants. And I promise I will see him because there's only two boxes down here. I'm one, and this guy is the other. Dr. Greg Gillespie. How you doing, Greg? I am awesome. I love that jersey you're rocking tonight. Look at that. Marines. Yep. Going old school. The glory <laughs> days. It is the glory days. Although I think you're going to be okay this year. I hope so. They they always seem to, uh, you know, like when, when they're, when they were good in the, you know, eighties, nineties and Buffalo started getting good. So yeah, we've had a little bad run of luck since the uh, early seventies, but uh, who knows? Could be our year. As every every year, uh, the the dolphin fan says that maybe this will be our year. <laughs> so, you were uh, busy this week, huh? Yeah, just a <laughs> little bit busy doing the rounds, uh, launching the Kickstarter, getting things ready to go. So, uh, thanks for having me tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and and talk about it, take some questions. So, um, you know, there's always new viewers that are uh, going to be coming on, um, probably even in this uh, live chat. Uh, you know, for those of you that don't know, we've had Greg on a couple of times because, um, you know, we, we like him. Um, 
he is, um, let's just say, uh, one of us. Um, but uh, like I said, there always are new people. Can you give us your, um, you know, a short little bio of yourself? You know, Greg, where you came from, you know, role playing, what you do, all that stuff. Sure. Um, so I, I live in uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, my parents immigrated from uh, Scotland. So um, the Britishness is a big, big part of, of who I am and, and what I'm about. And uh, I'm an academic, so I'm a cultural historian and um, teach courses on, I have a great course on the history of role playing games and also teach courses on video games as well as uh, some other stuff. So uh, it's most days it's amazing and I really enjoy it. And I also uh, publish creatively uh, with uh, role playing games and go to conventions and uh, write adventures and um and i'm definitely in, in the group i'm one of us you know like i love to roll dice and and be in my basement doing the stuff that uh that makes for great games great campaigns and having fun with my friends just like everybody else excellent excellent um yeah you are a, you are in the unique position of being uh, let's just say a right of center university professor up in canada <laughs> that makes you a unicorn does it not <laughs> uh yes yeah, so a unicorn a bengal tiger whatever rare uh yeah. rare species you want to uh, apply i'm definitely that well greg uh you you take a lot of uh shit uh <laughs> and he, occasionally he will show me the shit that he takes you know personally um He's been called the four letter, you know, N word, the the bad guys from Germany, all that stuff. Um, but he perseveres on and he makes uh, very good stuff. Uh, I, my first introduction to his stuff was when I ran uh, Barrow Maze in, um, you know, in my D&D group. And um, not only did I like running it, it's, it's, it's not often where, you know, the DM just finds it an absolute joy to run but the players even though i think three of them ended up dying in it they they really liked it uh because greg puts a little authenticity into his stuff uh researches it well and uh it, it shines through it really does well i appreciate that um you know I, I do try to um like i guess i'm i'm kind of guilty of I, I i like to make the adventures that i always wanted to play when i was like you know um, gaming hardcore, like full weekends and things like that when I was a teenager with my friends. And, and so I, I'm inspired by, by that. And, and I try to, um, put the texture and charm and, uh, love of the game into it that, you know, I think draws us back to it all the time to crack open our books and roll dice with our friends. And, and if I'm doing, if I'm succeeding in that, then, then that's really all I can ask for. You made mention, you know, in, and we'll get to it. We'll, we'll kind of go through the page, you know, play the trailer. You made mention of being inspired when you read a book. And I, I got to say, I, I feel the same way. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll hear like, oh, you know, this module's great or, you know, this adventure's great or this, these rules are great. And technically they are. But when you kind of flip through it, it's it's just flat. You know, the artwork is just a little. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's just kind of uninspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and having seen a uh, a little preview, uh, you know, we'll see a little bit more thanks to you. Um, I would say your your book is very inspiring. Um, it's going to be great. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. I uh, the the um, you know, like I think if you just think like if you walk into a bookstore or if you're at a con or whatever and you're walking by a table, um, maybe the name might catch you, but the art definitely will. So, you know, the art catches the eye. And then then after that, it's OK. Substantively, do we have a good rule set? Do we have a good game? Whatever it may be. Is it well laid out? Is it well thought out? Is it clear? And then and then after that, you're you're looking at all the all the rest of the art is you're flipping pages. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the, if you can inspire the people that are DMing games, then they're going to be hyped when they come to the table and convey those games to their players. And then their players will get excited. And then, then it starts to feed in a, in a, like a positive feedback loop at the table. So, um, you know, it's really important to me. I want to feel inspired just like I did picking up the AD and D player's handbook or the monster manual, whatever it is, and it makes me want to pick it up more. And I, and so I want coffee table appeal, 
but I also want a substantively great adventure or game that is um, clear, that can be easily picked up by somebody that has no experience, and yet uh, is hand in glove for the people that have played the game for decades. Such an underrated phenomenon, that inspiration that's contagious. I know exactly what you're talking about. I think any good DM worth their salt knows when they've been when they're excited about something and, you know, they just, they can't wait to, you know, pass it through, you know, to, to the players. I'll tell you what, um, why don't we right now, uh, why don't we just go to the, um, to the Kickstarter page. Um, and by the way, guys, the link is in the description and I'm going to occasionally throw it in the chat. Cal, I, I see you're here. Thank you as always, my friend for, uh, for being here as the moderator. Um, if you can copy and paste that, that's great. If not, I'll, I'll do it. It's, it's not a huge deal. Uh, but um, let's go to the page here. Um, you have a little uh, little trailer, uh, which I like. We'll go ahead and um, we will play it here. Damn, that is inspiring. Thanks. It, it was a lot of fun to do. It took a couple months, and uh, um, and the fellow I worked with, an Australian guy, he was just amazing, and we just nuanced that thing until we got it right where we wanted. And again, just like if that's that's something that gets me excited, and then if I'm excited, then hopefully you know I'm I'm conveying that uh, in other ways too, and and uh, so. It was a lot of fun, and I mean, I, I did a trailer for uh, Barrow Maze many years ago, and that was a lot of fun to do as well as more of a cartoon. So oh, the cartoon, it, I love that. I showed that to my players, and we <laughs> they they loved it. Yeah, it was uh, it was great. Hi, Charlotte. Um, I, I love the dripping, you know, as it's going in, just like the dripping of water. You, you can almost picture, you know, without showing any pictures, you know, you close your eyes, and you know, it's like you're you're going through a cave, you know, a lair. And then all of a sudden you see it. Um, it obviously, uh, Dragon Slayer, you know, there was a movie uh, of that name. Did you, um, Not now I'm not saying there is any connection, but uh, did you like that movie, um, Dragon Slayer? Oh, it's one of my favorite movies of all mm -hmm. time. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, you know, when, um, you know, the trademarking process for Dragon Slayer started early last winter, and I was shocked to see that it wasn't trademarked in any category. So we moved ahead with that in anticipation of uh, moving forward with the game. And, and then uh, the, the fonts are custom done as well from, you know, the Celtic family of fonts. Uh, so again, connecting back to the sort of Britishness I spoke about on, on the opening. So um, uh, I, I'm very pleased with how it turned out, the logo. Um, also, you know, if you take a look at it, it's a uh, it's, uh, Celtic knot. So... Uh, I was, yep. you know, excited to sort of incorporate that a little bit and it turned out really well, I thought. 
just it proud, just proudly displaying the OSR. Um, how beautiful! <laughs> I mean, that was uh, you are you are one of the standard bearers um, of OSR. I think you're everything that OSR should be. Well, um, I appreciate that. That's very kind. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, go through. I'm going to stop my camera because I have to read a little, and um, hard to do with uh, with the shades, Greg. <laughs> I'm sure. So you uh, blew blew through your goal in about a day, for uh, fourteen thousand. And I, when I first saw it, I'm like, "Ooh, yeah, that's a, you know, fourteen thousand. That's a pretty, um, you know, it's, it's it's not a huge goal, but it's like, oh, okay, you're setting the bar, you know, a little high." And then I just saw all the uh, all the pledges coming in, and I'm like, "Holy shit, he's gonna he's gonna go through this in one day." What was your uh, feeling uh, that first day as you kind of saw everything kind of coming together? Well, um, in, in the Kickstarters that I've run, so to give you an example, um, Drero Deep, which ran a couple of years ago, uh, it had like 780 backers, about 25% of those were um, uh, fifth edition people, maybe about 20%. And mm -hmm. given Watsi's stupidity, I'll never do anything to support any edition that they ever do again. So I was anticipating fewer numbers. Having said all that, the OSR, when, when I put a project forward, the OSR comes forward to support me. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I'm very humbled and very appreciative of that support. And that's why I invest, you know, everything I possibly can to make to make these um, these books as uh, as uh, inspiring uh, as I can. So, you know, um, I'm very, very thankful. Uh, and and I uh, plan to repay that trust with a great game that uh, hopefully has tons of longevity. There'll be a compatibility license as well. So if you you know want to make like a 32 pager, you want to make a supplement, you want to make um, whatever you want to do, you'll be able to do that. There won't be any silliness about, you know, um, you see some of these um, different uh, licenses with behavioral clauses and whatever. I don't give a crap about any of that. I believe very strongly in freedom of speech. So if you want to make something that's, um, you know, a little darker than I would prefer, great. If you want to make something that's more lighthearted, you can do that too. You can take it in the direction that, that you'd like to take it. I think that's a smart move. In fact, I, I, I give high praise to, uh, to the Shadow Dark uh, creator, Kelsey, because, I you know, I've kind of looked at her, uh, you know, at her, at her license. Very simple. And yet, like you said, there's no... You know, there's no behavioral clause or anything. So that's the way to go these days. Um, just be free. Let people do it. I know um, I'm working on an adventure right now. Um, and th the timing may work out. I am I am uh, definitely going to do a uh, Dragon Slayer version of it. Um, this makes me re really want to. Um, you know, I'm just <laughs> very inspired. Um, let's take a look. So what is Dragon Slayer? Classic fantasy RPG. It's inspired from the intersection of Moldvay Basic and First Edition, which would be advanced. So talk about that. You always call this 0.75, don't you? Yeah. So, so the um, you know, if we if we take a look at AD and D objectively, right? So there are a whole bunch of rules in there. The whole edition was created to screw Arneson out of royalties. So having said that, there are a lot of rules in there that aren't good rules. And as much as I have great, great esteem for Gary Gygax, nothing but respect. But at the same time, there was a political motivation why some rules were included in AD&D and they weren't really great ones. And I think, you know, you've done a good job of showing some of Gygax's um, forum posts in the past in which he acknowledged, yeah, you know, some of these rules weren't all that great. He wished he could have a couple do-overs. I agree, I agreed with him. You know, uh, I agreed back in the day, I agreed, I still agree now. So the Moldvay basic engine, uh, Moldvay is the most elegant edition of Dungeons & Dragons, as far as I'm concerned, to accommodate the whole game in such a, sh uh, such a, a low page count. It's really amazing. So that's the goal. You want to have the, the iterative essence, that's it right there, of Moldvay basic. Yep. And if you can do that, you're on your way. Now, having said that, we all love the cool classes and spells and, and et cetera than uh, of AD&D. &D. So it's the merger of those two things. And you can say, okay, well, that's been done. Well, that's fine. Um, but on top, layered on top of that are my house rules. So this is the game played at my table that 
that gave rise to Baromaze, that gave rise to Highfell, to Archaea, to Dwero Deep. So uh, this is this is the game that that uh, I've honed at my table, having included um, what I want from Moldy Basic, and then what I want from AD and D. Now, you want I, I believe the game is best at when it's simple. It doesn't have to be complex. You want the rules to fall into the background so the characters and the personalities and things like that can come forward. That's the sweet spot for the game. As soon as you let the rules take over interactions and plans and schemes and fun, now it's not, not great anymore. And so that's what, you're, that's what I'm trying to do is to have it simple at its, at its base, but then you can, as you go up in levels, you can expand spells, you can expand other things and make it more complex. The game, I've never really liked movement rules in um, in, a, in any early, in, in a, any TSR edition of d and I think they did a great job with third edition with five foot squares so that you can use miniatures if you want to. And I just think it makes a lot more sense given graph paper as well, using 10 by 10 you know, uh, for each square on your graph paper, I just, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, having said that, you don't need miniatures to play Dragon Slayer, but if you want to use miniatures, there no modifications are, are required. So you can theater of the mind it, you can play with miniatures, whatever you prefer. If you have terrain, it'll fit seamlessly with terrain. And this is stuff going all the way back to Baromaze that I was, I was, I was modifying movement rates 10, 12 years ago for my OSR uh, version of the game I play at my uh, at my table. So um, that, that's uh, some of the things I would speak about in that intersection of basic and first. But I always wondered, is are, are these rules essentially what you used in Barrow Maze? Yes. Yeah, because I was wondering, I'm like, the thing is any competent I don't want to say you have to be old school, you know, but anybody who was kind of brought up, you know, in any of the old editions of D and D, it's like a common language. It's like a, a a mother language. You know, there might be, you know, some thing, little things different here or there, you know. So I could understand it, but I couldn't quite figure it out. I'm like, well, well, this isn't like like old school essentials or anything like pure, you know, basic, and obviously it's not quite you know, first edition. So I guess it just made made sense that, yeah, you just went ahead and essentially almost like pre did a little preview of these rules by uh, just including them as the, uh, as the OSR version of uh, all your adventures, all your, uh, you know, mega dungeon adventures, by the way. Right. I so I, I, yeah. So what, like I had uh, like, Oh, just to, to jump in there. I have the yeah, game, go ahead, go ahead. The, I have the game that I run at my table. And mm -hmm. when I was going to publish Barrow Maze, um, Labyrinth Lord was the closest to the game in terms of right. trying to find a compatibility license to move forward. So, and even if you go back and you look at Barrow Maze, it has all the trappings of AD and D in there. So mm -hmm. that was just the closest. Now, having said that, um, when Dragon Slayer comes out, like zero changes are necessary because this is the game that, that I played all those mega dungeons with. So that I just just to be clear, you know, in case any of your viewers are, are wondering, um, sometimes you have to, you know, back in the day when when I was thinking about publishing Barrowmage, you had some decisions to make, like what which compatibility version are you going to go with? And it was the closest at the time. Now, fast forward, we're, you know, 12, 13 years later, whatever it is, and it's a different world. And uh, and I've had to move forward creating my own rule set. One of the reasons I've done that is that I don't want to be beholden to anybody else anymore. Uh, so uh, I've tried, I tried to support Labyrinth Lord for as long as I could. That's not possible anymore. And I made the decision two years ago, two years, three years, about that, definitely two and a half, to start working on my own version uh, of a rule set. And, and this has um, brought me to this point in time. How freeing that must be. Uh, Super Chat, $2, The Chill Gamer, you know, my new favorite uh, subscriber, channel member. Thank you very much. He just says, yo. Uh, well, yo, back to you, my friend. Thank you very much uh, for tonight and uh, last night. Hope you uh, hope you enjoy listening to uh, this very, very smart man. Um, I'll tell you what, let's um, let's read a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, yeah. As you said, it's the codification um and 
you you asked the question, which I'm sure you know other folks um, you know are bound to ask too. Why do we need another rule set? It's a fair question. Um, you refuse to continue publishing um, while being beholden to other people, the labyrinth lords, the wizards of the coast. You know the people that have just folded. You know, in the face of insanity, I guess yes, for lack of a better word. <laughs> you want to codify, you know, the game. Basically everything, um basically everything you said until we get to here and maybe we can talk about this. And I, I think I know uh the, the This is me just it. being like oh, here it is, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Who you're going after? Uh, easily annoyed at digest size books, uh small print, unreasonable gaps in layout, and art that's internally inconsistent. Mm -hmm. I think I know exactly who you're talking about, even though uh, it is a very good rule set. I want to be inspired by my game books. This is something we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to crack it open and just, ooh, I want to run that. You know, I want to include that. Yeah. Um, as basically just saying, you know, if you're not inspired, your players aren't exactly. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, I guess um, I guess we can say you're uh, you're not a not a huge fan of OSC. Okay, so I want to be crystal clear. I think the OSC folks do a great job, and obviously mm -hmm. they're prolific. And kudos mm -hmm. to them. Good but, rule set. Okay. Yeah. So good, good rule set. Yes, and it does exactly what it needs to do in terms of mimicking Moldvay Basic. But there, I do have. So we all have like the things that are are uh, make or break, right? And mm -hmm. as I've indicated here. I don't like digest size books. I don't. Um, and, you know, I don't like uh, print sizes that get too small. So I have chronically dry eyes and, and it's worse in the evening. So if I have really small print in the evening, it's tough on my eyes. And, and there are people out there who, you know, maybe have visual problems like I do, or maybe even worse, and they need a minimum font size too. So, so those are non-negotiables for me. And then the art has to be consistent. So, um, you know, I did, I did a, a couple fairly deep uh, academic studies of art in um, role-playing games. And I came to very specific conclusions about what the art, how the art reflects the rule set. And too often we see art that doesn't reflect the rule set at all. For example, if you're in a medieval fantasy setting, like how many people are going to shave? Like nobody's going to shave. Like, like really, there's going to be beards everywhere. Um, and then, you know, uh, think of like art from third edition with like spiked shoulder pads and like the sort of dungeon punk uh, aesthetic. That's just lame. Um, and, it doesn't age well. And the other, the other thing, you know, I went to Scotland when I was about uh, 14. And uh, I went through a tour of a castle and there was a two-handed sword. And the person who was giving me, giving the tour, uh, picked the biggest person in the crowd, which was me. And he said, okay, come forward. I want you to pick up this two-handed sword. And I couldn't even get the tip off the ground. And I wasn't small at age 14 either. And, and, and that's always stuck in my mind. So when we see this art, and you see it a lot in video games, and from video games, it's trickled down to RPGs where the swords just look like they're, you know, a foot and a half across, um, hanging over the shoulder. And it just, it's it breaks the frame. It's not, so you have to be grounded in, in some basic uh, understandings of physics and, um, and, and also what people can reasonably do. And, and, that has to be uh, granted. It's medieval fantasy, and but but I want to be grounded in in medieval fantasy. I don't want to extend the fantastical, and the fantastical is not grounded, and it has to be grounded to be believable. And this is the mistake that Wizards of the Coast and other companies make on the regular. Artists do it all the time, and I am constantly telling my artists the weapon's too big, or the weapon's too small, or the width is too wide, and I'll send them historical examples. Like, look, here's a two-handed sword. Like, look look at what you're drawing versus what we have in reality. And, and so I, I always try to pull back to, to the medieval understandings, and then the fantasy part is going to be the spell casting, the monsters, and so on and so forth, right? So we need to be grounded in, in history and reality, 
and yet at the same time include the fantasy in ways that make sense. I know that's important to you because um, you you do have a YouTube channel um, and you are you are busy doing far more important things than uh, being a YouTuber uh, like me. But I, I remember in your review of the D and D movie, you were just kind of remarking how it just didn't look aesthetically. It didn't look good. It didn't look lived in. You know, probably they were probably breaking every rule. You know, you just said yeah uh, with that movie. And the woman that plays the barbarian is five foot four. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, I don't I don't buy it. And even if you go back to, uh, you know, some fairly, uh, you know, B 1980s fantasy films, they still picked very large, very tall, athletic women to play their roles. You can think Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. Um, you can think uh, Red Sonia, for example. So if, yeah. if I'm going to have a ragey barbarian, um, a woman, she's not going to be five foot four. She's going to probably be in the five, nine to five, you know, to six foot range. Um, somebody that could handle themselves athletically and and it's just a little bit more believable to me. So having said that, everyone's welcome to you know their own their own view. Uh, it's just you know these are again, I try to base it in reality and um, and start there. Well, I got I, you know I got nothing against Michelle Rodriguez. Um, that's who played her, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, mm-hmm. But you know if I'm making that film, and to your point, I think if it was uh, in the 80s, You'd have been looking for like, you know, a li- a tall, live, you know, you know, like dancer, you know, like Sandal Bergman or, you know, these days, God, why, why don't you just go to the WWE? I mean, you get a fee, get a good looking female wrestler, you know, teach her how to handle a sword. You know, they already kind of know how to act already. Um, just just get someone like that who looks the part and can you know, basically pull off. Yeah. I mean, it's so, sometimes, you know, and I know they were going, you know, they wanted to go, uh, you know, big names and all that, but it's like, you didn't make a successful movie. You know, what would have made a better movie? Well, maybe if, you know, they'd have listened to, you know, some of, you know, critiques like yours, you know, it might've been a little bit more successful. Um, well, they can hire me as a consultant and I'll, 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 uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take my hammer and give them a whack every now and again. And, hey, and you're not doing it right. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you talk about, um, you know, how Dragon Slayer is different from other rule sets, you know, Mold Bay Basic, a fine-tuned machine, and uh, you've said, you know, you've already said it even here, the most internally consistent <laughs> edition ever created, I do agree. You know, but Gary's edition had quite a bit to offer, too, you know, just, a, you know, at times just a, a glorious mess, um, of just goodies and that's one of the reasons why we love it right so yes it has that texture because it's uneven and i get that and i'm not trying to smooth out the wrinkles i'm just trying to smooth out the wrinkles that aren't fun at the table yes yep now th- this is where i kind of want to ask some questions uh, and i found this uh, paragraph pretty intriguing having said that uh, Dragon Slayer uses the engine of BX with a Chrome of first edition. You've used that term uh, before. What does that mean? It means the combat engine, casting, and initiative reflect the former, and the cool stuff reflects the latter. Um, so why don't we stop there? Initiative. Is it die six? Yeah. yeah. No segments. I hate, hate counting segments. There's no need for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Easy peasy. Um there were also issues with one E that needed to be addressed. There were, like like we said, it was a glorious mess. Uh, incredible in some areas. Head scratching in others. For example, uh, dragons were too weak. I do agree with that. Demon and devil types were internally inconsistent. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, if you read through them, um, you, like, you've got, if you look at the hit dice of, of the mid-rank and low-rank demons and devils, they don't make a lot of sense. So uh, I've I've addressed that. It's not a big change, but it's a change. Mm-hmm. Um, Ruids were hosed. They were hosed. So Gary Gygax, for him, magic users were uh, were the pet cat, right? And mm-hmm. as a result, illusionists get hosed, and druids also get hosed. So. Um, I've, I've addressed that in the spell lists and then also in some of the class abilities. 
Well, the most intriguing for me, I read this and I was like, ooh, this is sexy. The, the monk was non-Western. Yeah. Are you, are you, do you have monks and, and what kind of monks are they going to be? So they're monks, but I, they're not Shaolin monks. Now I can appreciate the time in which I came forward, Kung Fu and all that stuff. I get it. Uh, but having said that, if you, if you look at the orientation of AD&D, it's Eurocentric. It's Western Eurocentric. And in that context, the monk looks out of place. So it what I've happens. done, yeah, what I've done is I've gone back and I've just um, made the monk an extension of like a monastic clerical order. And, uh, and, and it fits more neatly with the material in my humble mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having the, uh, the, the, like the Oriental monk has, has just caught, has probably caused so many DMs to just on the fly, they have to create some Asian land, you know, some Ori, some Orient in their world. Like, oh yes, yeah, here, here I come, you know, <laughs> far traveler. Okay. Um, it never, it never made sense to me. Like, like, yeah, everything else is so Western European and then. You know, here comes uh, David Carradine. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I just think it, it, it's it's um, it fits. It fits much better. Absolutely. Um, you say halfway between the two point seven five art and aesthetics. Now we will uh, we'll d delve into this first here, and then I'll I'll uh, show the folks what you uh, what you sent me. Um, you've got your. You know your view of how classic fantasy RPG should look, mm -hmm. and uh, you are working with some pretty good artists. Ken and James, who's really good. Peter Pagano, Stephen Thompson, but then you know we start getting into the likes of Jeff Easley, Darlene, yeah. Diesel, Ian Leby, Eric Hotz. Here's the Dragon Slayer cover art. So is this going to be on the uh, on the cover? Yes, sir. Wow. That is really good. Yeah, I mean, oh, to man. me, that's like looking at the, uh, the 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 front cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yes, they're kind of they're looking right at you, coming just coming out of something. You know, she's ready to cast a spell. Damn, they look look like they're just getting ready to go right into battle, looking right at you. Holy smokes! What is it? Um, do you ever have any trouble? Uh, with some of these folks, given your political leanings? Um, well, one I have, and that was recent, uh, but uh, overall, no, because quite honestly, like when I, when I, uh, it has nothing to do with that. Like, are, in my view, maybe I'm naive, but as adults, as mature adults, we can have different views and still work together. Like in your work, in your workplace, I'm sure you have people of all different stripes and varieties. You still have to work together to get a job done. And my my feeling has always been that I park uh, when I when I when I work. I park my my politics, and um, I'm I'm trying to do that as a mature professional. Um, Ninety nine percent of of people from our generation or older can do that. So um, I've had no no trouble, and in fact, it's. Um, been with, with the one exception, it's been the opposite. You know, people, um, respect the fact that, that you know who you are, that you have an opinion and that you also park it when it needs to be parked. And so when I go to a convention, I, I run fun games. Um, when I make games, I try to make fun games and, you know, I don't think that people can, can go through my stuff and say that, that, um, I'm heavy, even not, certainly not heavy handed. I'm not even light handed. In comparison to people like Wizards of the Coast, in comparison to people uh, and other and other companies that are um, heavy on the message in everything that they do, no, who wants that? We want to have fun at the table. Seventy-one people in here. If you guys could do me a favor, first uh, hit hit the old like button. That'll always help uh, get this seen. And this is a uh, normally, you know, after I do a live stream, you know, I, I consider it, you know, like fast food. You know, it's done. You know, it's great. You know, you know, after the first day, after you know the people who missed it catch up, you know, it, it's fine. This is one I kind of want out there uh, for a while. 
uh, I want uh, this to get a little uh, recognition. So if you could please uh, hit the like button. I rarely ask you guys to do that because um, I, I never want to sound like I'm, you know, begging you guys to do something. But for this one, and it's not for my sake, it's for Greg's because, uh, you know, that's uh, what we're talking here. And, you know, I, getting back to what you were saying, it's why I had such a visceral dislike of, you know, the the book that started my channel, The Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel because it was so overtly political and you know i'm you know i'm i'm political um in in my real life you know very um right of center republican libertarian um ideals i have never once running a game tried to like craft something like ooh you know maybe maybe i can get my friends at the table you know to 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 start uh, seeing the light, you know, if there, you know, I have a couple of friends who are, you know, a little more left leaning. It's like that has never even crossed my mind. You know, it's always just classic storytelling: what works, what doesn't work. So to think that people are so blatantly doing it, and it is mostly on the other side. You know, I'm not saying there aren't a few, you know, on the right side, but by and large, it, it's on the left that they're trying to jam this message down your throat. It's just destroying the industry from within. I agree but, I mean, completely. We, but those people are driving like moderates and conservative leaning people away, um, yes. which is fine because there's a home for them other places. And, uh, you know, um, I think at the end of the day, if if you put your heart and your soul into something and you're you're giving a piece of you in what you create, People see that and it resonates. And they also know the opposite when things are hollow, when it's when there isn't when it's just like factory built based on a message. So I agree. Yep. Uh, Two dollar super chat. T.A. Hawkins. Don't know. Have I seen you, T.A.? Uh, if not, uh, welcome. Uh, great to see you. Thank you so much. Is the internal art in color looks awesome? I think he's referring to the. Um, to the uh, cover there. Uh, is the internal art, are there any color plates or anything in there or is it uh, B&W? No, just black and white. And mm -hmm. that, that's my medium. That That is my creative space. And um, I think that it's such an evocative art form, um, black and white line art, as you'll see here in a moment. Yeah, so, I was going to say, let's let's segue into that uh, because uh, this is some, some really beautiful work. Uh, boy, Ken and James, he, he knocks it out of the park. Uh, first in your, um, you know, mega dungeons and man here here are some of the uh <laughs> i think we all know who this might be behold As, yes <laughs> isn't that great oh my lord here let's uh let's kind of get them uh see if i can get them uh mostly in one here yep there's asmodeus garyon is that how you mm -hmm. pronounce it garyon mm -hmm. Here's the ambush uh, from above. <laughs> yeah. The thief, uh, the thief going in. God, the, if that's the kind of art we're talking, uh, boy, you weren't wrong uh, <laughs> when you said inspiring. Because I see that stuff, and it's like, how many people still remember, you know, Emerald the Chaotic? You know, the the classic Dave Trampier um, mm -hmm. art. I mean, just just going through town like a badass, <laughs> just wasting people. Yeah. It's that kind of art that you just you remember. Oh, for exactly. sure. I, and you know, Ken and James is so talented. If if he was illustrating, say for first edition back in the day, we would be thinking of him as we think of Dave Trampier today. Uh, he would be yep. he would be extolled and lauded for his artistic talent. There's and you can see like. So I think to me, black and white is a challenge. Um, it's, it's a challenge to have it leap off the page without color. And I can tell you, and I'm sure your listeners know as well, we've all flipped through full color books that with the art does not leap off the page. And to me, and, and again, just my opinion, I think this leaps off the page. Without it, it's so strong uh, graphically. Um, like you said, um, you know, my daughter's a uh, graphic, she's going to school for graphic design and, you know, oh, really impress on her, you know, the, just how, how strong this stuff is, mm -hmm. you know, just the, the black background and 
just how, how stark. Um, right. you gave Ken, me, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, uh, Kenan um, is as inspired by this milieu as I am. And so you put us together and, and then, you know, and, and then we go back and forth and, and he gets, he, he can see in his mind's eye what I have in my mind, mind's eye and, and same with Peter Pagano and, and it just all comes together. And, and uh, I'm just very fortunate that I've got people like this that want to work with me. Absolutely. Well, you also gave a little, um, a little preview to me. So, um, this is a, uh, I guess, uh, we can say an exclusive. A little bit of art here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so this so is a new cool. artist I, I haven't worked with before. This is the first time. Uh, this is Val Schmex, if I have his uh, last name correct. He's done work for Jeff Telanian and his uh, astonishing swordsman work. And, uh, and so he did this illustration, which was inspired by a piece in a certain first edition book. And let's see if anybody in the chat can guess what the piece of art it, it was inspired by. You, you can monitor the chat because uh, I, I can't see it right now. Um, yeah, see no if everybody gets it. Um, <laughs> but, oh man, that is so cool. Um, you also give us a little uh, little preview of the uh, the thief here. Yep. If you guys can see that, I I, I love the uh, the titles. Why, why they stopped doing that, um, heaven only knows. Um, but uh, it would be great, you know, to have your character like I'm just a thug. Then the DM can work it in, like, oh, what level are you? you know, level two. All right. And then some NPC refers to him. You know, listen here, knave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Beautiful. Hit die one die six. Yep. Looking pretty familiar. I like it. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I like um, you don't. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to iterate, and uh, I'm not like there are some changes. So, for example, the Cyclopsmen that you find in Dwero Deep, they're one of the playable classes, or excuse me, playable races um, oh, that right. you have in the race section. That's the only real major change in the race section. Uh, there are tweaks to the classes because, as I said, they reflect my my home game. And um, you did bring up in, in our pre-chat, you talked about uh, Thaco. So we can address that if you scroll back up yeah. to the top of the page. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I have a very flat curve for power. So let's say uh, whether, you, whether you learn the game in terms of Thaco or you learned it in terms of base attack bonus, uh, this will make sense to you either way. So I have a very flat curve. Um, it's a low power game in terms of attack bonus to level, whether you're a fighter or a cleric or a thief or whatever. But there are other bonuses to be had tactically that you have to, if you want those bonuses, you have to take advantage of your tactics in combat. So um, that's, so the bonuses are there to be had, but you have to work for them rather than just getting them because you're a plus one uh, to hit as a first level fighter. Now, at the bottom of the character sheet, like on all my character sheets, there's a matrix for uh, to hit AC 10 all the way to AC zero. And that really doesn't change um, much at all. But you can think in terms of your base attack bonus if you want to. So you can put, you need a 20 to hit AC zero, you need a 10 to hit, um, uh, or excuse me, you need a, a 20 to hit AC zero or a 10 to hit uh, AC or unarmored or 10. And then the math is super easy and you're not really thinking in terms of fact or subtracting. You can just say, okay, well, um, I'm a fourth level thief. I have a plus one to my attack bonus and my, I don't have a strength mm -hmm. bonus. So I, uh, you can roll, you can add to it. And then you can look at your chart at the bottom of the character sheet. So you could use that or you could use base attack bonus. You can do it either way. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. Yep. These guys, should, I think people do do make a little too much out of it. I mean, we, we played 
we played second edition for nigh a decade and um we had a we had a good time uh with it and um and that was with and that was full on Thacko. So yeah, so this sounds pretty easy. So very yeah, don't be uh don't be uh you know uh now when, when I away by that when I play I do target twenty as a DM. So um so I uh roll my die, I add the players armor class mm -hmm. and the hit dice of the monster and if it reaches 20 it's a hit oh yeah yep some sometimes you know i th sometimes i think change is just just kind of good like that i mean I don't know, you, you, sometimes you just get lulled into this complacency and it's like I, I look at the time i understand you know what a revolution like third edition was you know by kind of reversing things and get, getting rid of all that um, you know, and it, it does work, you know, to some extent, I know, you know, mathematically I, I can grasp it pretty easy too, mm -hmm. but part of me just says, sometimes it's good to kind of challenge yourself a, a little bit, you know, with, and this isn't even like challenging it, but just changing things up just a hair. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, people are just afraid, like, oh my God, you, you changed something. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, it's not, not that big a deal. And I, I get frustrated with people that play thieves because then they don't actually do their thief skills. So what I've tried to do is each class page faces each other. So if you back out a little bit, you can you see the two page layout, right? This is the same for every class. So okay. everything's sitting there flat on these two pages. You don't have to flip back to the race section to see your thief skill bonuses. You can do everything right there, right on the page. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just going to make it, and you've got your, um, your level one saving throws, actually level one to four, uh, that mm -hmm. first line of your saving throws. So you can just write that mm -hmm. in. So it should be much easier for the inexperienced player that doesn't really know uh, all mm -hmm. the page flipping involved in RPGs. Yeah, that's, I know that is something that uh, old school essentials did get really well is the layout. Mm -hmm. it, it was a, It's a very well laid out game. It looks like um, kind of, you know, doing a similar thing here by having the, the class one page. I like it. Uh, shall we move on to the next one? Absolutely. All right. Here they are. <laughs> the bad boys. Yeah. And girls and girls. No, I you have should my, be playing uh, the theme to, uh, to cops while we look at this one. Yeah. Bad boys. <laughs> I actually have my, uh, my first edition monster manual here. It's a reprint. I lost my uh, original. Yeah, so some of the stuff is is similar, you know, to the original. Some uh, a little different. Um, what did you find you had to tweak with these guys? Uh, so again, because there's some unevenness uh, in how they're represented, um, I, I tried to just think of it logically: uh, who's in charge of what layer or what level, and mm -hmm. uh, and then also then and then there was a, an undercurrent, a subtext of the political dynamic always at play. So at the front of each of the demon section and the devil section, I lay out the dynamic. And then, so if later on is if you play playing a more high level game that might involve some of these characters, they, um, the person running the game has uh, options to think of politically what the situation might be if the players go to hell or they go to, uh, um, you know, some, uh, or they have interaction with these, these personalities. It's probably a good point to say right now that, and I think you you do say it, um, you know, in the uh, Kickstarter page that you, you don't believe in splat books. Like this no. is a self this is a self contained ship in a bottle. How big is this book going to be? Three hundred pages. That is robust, so, and you are going to have the rules, the classes, the monsters. The you know DM advice and all that stuff. Um, the treasure, the magic treasure. items. It's 40, 45,000 words just in spells. It's forty five thousand words in monsters. It's forty five thousand words in uh, magic items. I mean, I, I don't see. I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to get this book. I mean, it just even if it was just all right. Well, I don't know if I'm going to play it, but I would want this even if I didn't intend to play this i would want this sitting on my shelf just good lord it, can you think of a better bathroom book than just essentially one book that has everything <laughs> in it well that's Holy it so smokes remember from the kickstarter page and we spoke earlier i want the iterative simplicity and elegance of bx 
but with the, the Chrome of, of first edition, right? So if uh, that's what I'm shooting for, I'm not saying I'm going to get there. I'm trying hard, though. Very hard. <laughs> um, one second here as I uh, read a super chat again. Uh, T.A. Hawkins, is the magic system modular? Can it be played low magic? Does the game come with a predefined world? Can you answer so, that, Greg? Um, the magic system is Vancian, so that's a non-negotiable for me. Um, and it's what everyone's accustomed to. Uh, can it be played low magic? Absolutely. It's low power, low magic. So uh, the emphasis is on player ingenuity, player intelligence. And and if you probably, you know what should come parceled with this book, with this rule book, is Sun Tzu's The Art of War. So if, if your players, you know, don't know how to connive, they don't know how to sneak they don't know how to sabotage they don't know how to how to pepper the enemy before you engage in melee combat then you know the rules so like if we just think about it logically right there's there's what's in in the rules and then there's the unwritten rules right so if, if you grew up and you're watching your older brother play and you know they didn't want the kids at the table where the big boys were playing then you had to sit there and watch and you learned that you, you always fight on ground of your choosing, fight on high ground. Um, if you're gonna attack in trench position, have at least three times the number. Uh, pepper your opponent with ranged attacks and spells before you engage in melee combat. And a lot of that wasn't actually written into any of the rules, but you had to learn that over time. And sometimes you had to learn it the hard way. Well, I've, been, I've um, codified all those things to encourage you to do those. There are advantages. So, you know, if you take a look at, you know, some of the past editions of the game that use base combat bonus, the fighter is a plus one at level one, plus one at level two, plus three at level three, and so on and so forth. And that's just a, that's just a cheap way. That's just a kind of lazy tactical role playing to me. I think that it, you, you can get all those bonuses, but you know, set up an ambush for your opponent. Um, use those spells, use those ranged attacks, uh, soften them up, then send your fighters in to uh, to do the dirty work. Nice. Um, well, it looks like uh, Eric, He, I think Eric was the one who was like, I'm not sure about a FACO game. And then he said, uh, Greg, just pledged. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to have. I'm going to make an awesome game. Something that you're going to be hyped about. I hope. And I'm 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 peeking, Greg, because I I kind of just took a, a quick you know look before we started. I think we were at twenty four eighty eight, twenty thousand four eighty eight. We're already over twenty one thousand now. So I think you're getting, uh, I think you're getting some uh, sales from this uh, this fine chat we always have here. Thank you guys as always for coming out. Seventy. Thank you so much. Time. Yes, I appreciate yeah. it very much. Boy, it's, it's it's almost exactly like a Wednesday. Um, it's um, um, amazing. Everybody showed up in force, uh, but I think that has more to do with you <laughs> than it does uh, with me. <laughs> no, I don't think so. We, uh -huh. we what, just to just to jump in while we're taking a look at this uh, demons and devils section. What I've tried to do, just like in my adventures. So if um, if we get into the demons and devils section, I have the same artist doing that section. So. Um, Ken and James did Demons and Devils. Peter Pagano did um, Dragons. Uh, Corey Hamill did uh, Golems. So you've got some aesthetic consistency when you get into those little subsections within the monsters. Okay. And I, I can't remember if you, did, did you say this is, is it strictly Vancean? I'm sorry if I missed yes. that. Yes, it's Vancean Magic, which means um, uh, Jack Vance's spell system that Gary Gygax poached into into uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So you memorize your spells in the morning and then you cast them and then you lose sort of the memory of the specific machinations of those spells. You know the, you know the spell, but you don't necessarily recall the gestures and, and components and so on. And then you have to memorize them again the next day and that's called fancy and spell casting. Yeah, I'm sorry. It actually, yeah, it wasn't Eric. It was Tora who said it wasn't that good. Did we sell you yet, Tora? That's that's the uh, that's the question. Hopefully, hopefully we're we're doing a good job. Uh, like I said, this guy, this, I'm really, you know, you said you were going to do a book. I look, I was going to buy it anyway. Um, but man, it just kind of hit me the the name and the font 
boy, you you did your homework there because I was like, whoa, D- Dragon Slayer. I'm like that. That is really, that is really cool. <laughs> Oh, thanks, yeah. man. Like it, a lot of thought went into it, and I was very finicky with this font. I I needed certain things to happen uh, with it just to so it le- leaps off the page a bit, and I, I hopefully hopefully it does that. Mm-hmm. Uh, another super chat from T. A. Hawkins. He's the uh, VIP. One one step closer to the inner circle. Uh, Two dollar super chat. Thank you so much. Will there be future support like expansions? I imagine you'll probably be just be doing adventures too for this, right? Like you always have. Right. So I, as I said earlier, I don't like splat books, um, and. So I want everything in one book. So like, let's say you decide to make an adventure, whether it's just for your home group or whether you want to publish something, you don't have to pick one book up and put the other one down and then pick up another book and put the other one down and so on and so forth. This is one game complete all in one. Now, um, there will be a compatibility license for anybody that wants to do their own thing. You want to make an adventure, a supplement, whatever, and there'll be a little compatibility logo like you, like the um, the Celtic um, dragon knot that we've got going on there. It says Dragon Slayer at the top, like you see in the background there, and it says compatible underneath. So you can put that on the cover of, uh, of your work. And then um, in terms of future supplements, the only one I have planned beyond adventures is going to be um, the, so I have a, a 34 inch by 34 inch full color hex map of the game world in which all my mega dungeons are set and that inspired the Dragon Slayer rules. So probably in about a year, year and a half, I'm going to, I'll kickstart this map and it is a thing of beauty. It's stunning. And it'll have a, a, a book gazetteer that will go along with it that will have, um, uh, each each region defined uh, with um, all the political things going on, and counter tables for the various forests and and uh, locations as well, and uh, and all the mega dungeons are placed in this huge hex map. You have your next mega dungeon kind of rattling around. I mean, I know you're fixated on on getting this done, but do you have an idea for your next one? I do. And I, so I had a, uh, I did a wonderful research trip to Ireland looking at uh, Neolithic burial mounds and standing stones. And that was um, part of the, uh, part of the impetus for the trip was research for the next mega dungeon, which will be the fifth in a series of six. So, uh, and then once I'm done, I was asked recently, you know, what will I do after that? Um, I don't know. I think probably I'll try my hand at a typical t- TSR 32 pager, uh, for a while after that. Nice. Uh, TA Hawkins, another super chat again. Thank you very much. Uh, coming on strong, getting good vibes from you, my man. Um, any plans for a campaign setting or a base world? Sounds like Greg, maybe just kind of answered that. Uh, he's going to have a gazetteer, uh, probably with some thumbnail sketches. I'm pretty sure of kingdoms and stuff like that. Right, Greg? Oh yeah, um, it'll. I, I'm a big fan of heraldry, especially you know Gaiax's inclusion of heraldry and Greyhawk and things like that. So if you go through my mega dungeons, you're gonna see I have a coat of arms for each of the regions, and uh, it's it has all kinds of. I draw inspiration uh, for from all kinds of different things for that. So yes, absolutely, the campaign setting will have the map, um, and I've done. I, if you're in the Barrow Maze Facebook group, I've posted some teaser pics of this huge hex map. It is, it is, it'll fit on a wall. It's 34 inches by 34 inches. It's going to be amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is, uh, that is beefy. Uh, thanks again, uh, TA. Um, hey, what, let us, uh, let's move around here a little bit. We got, there's Ball. Hi, Ball. Nice to see you. There's Gary on. Mm-hmm. We saw the picture of him before. I, I think it's great that you did do the little political, the hell political thing. <laughs> oh, because they're all trying to stab each other in the back and, yeah. and jump up the hierarchy, right? And that's cool. That's yeah. really amazing. Oh, and it's, yeah. it makes for great role play. Yep. Dispiter. Do you have, uh, what's what's his name's daughter? Is she in this? Was an, didn't Asmodeus have a daughter? Um yeah. I um, I do have a few. Uh, I don't want to give everything away. I don't have every demon and devil, but I got most of them. Nice. 
Right, so let's pull back here so you can kind of see. Oh, there we go. Oh, Mammon. There's Fatso himself. Man. There he is. Yep. The slug. Wait. Here's some others. There are the giants. Oh, wow. Let us, uh, one second here. I gotta, I gotta read this. This is <laughs> fire giant. Oh man. Look, I'm just looking at that art. That is really good. That is good. Hill giant. Holy smokes. 12 feet tall. Yep. Five die six damage. That'll take out, uh, that'll probably take out a mid-level character. Uh, right. Five yeah, not, not uh, for the faint of heart. <laughs> There's the hill giant. You could start with a hill giant. Go pick a fight with a hill giant instead. They're only doing one die eight. That stone giant is badass. Look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Look at that, look at that front and center. <clears throat> Damn. Yeah, I've always had a thing for stone giants. To me, they were always kind of a like a realistic giant them and hill giants uh I, I always liked fire giants and frost giants but you kind of you do have to kind of uh, bend your world just a little bit uh you know you either got to be in a really really cold place or you know fire giants to me sometimes are they're almost like supernatural uh, creatures um boy i like that i even like that frost giant too yeah four i six that's a great picture too man i love that Um, and you had a super chat there for um, from Higgs McGiggs. Any oh, plans for a cloth map or a premium edition? Maybe. Um, so I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Um, but you know, I I I take a long term view. So I've got something planned out for you know about a year and a half down the road. I've got something else planned for about two years after that. So you know, there's a um, th these things take a lot of time. And when you want great artists, sometimes you have to get in the queue and wait for their availability. So that means you have to be thinking way in advance. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, uh, you know, how, how I go about things. I'm thinking, I, I, I can see in my, close my eyes, I can see in my mind's eye what I, what I want in terms of the look, say, for a particular monster or a particular full page sketch. And then you have to think, um, you know, down, you have to be thinking down the road. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Higgs. And you remember what Greg said, too, about having this license. I mean, you know, people were asking, like, supplements and all that. I mean, in addition to adventures, I mean, if, if you wanted to do a supplement, different classes or whatever, I mean, I think that's covered under the license, is it not? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can, um, you know, say, so, for example, my barbarian might differ significantly from the barbarian that you prefer. And if you want to make a supplement that has... Uh, you know, uh, a barbarian of your choice, then of course you can do, you'll be able to do that. I mean, I, I can think of, of one hole that, you know, some industrious person may mm. already feel maybe there, you know, there are people and I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting the impression maybe it's not included, but we were talking about the, uh, you know, the Eastern monk, you know, the Asian oriental, mm -hmm. uh, monk character. Um, if that's not in the base book, what's to prevent, you know, someone from, you know, doing a little, little PDF, um, you know, and taking their stab at what that would be like in your rules, right? A hundred percent. And, you know, part of the thing is uh, when, when you, you make this stuff and, and you put a lot of resources and time into it and creating relationships with artists so that you can get what you want. But at, then at the end of the day, you have to let it go and you have to let it go because if you don't let it go, it'll, it will never have legs. And, and you want people to embrace it and you want people to push it and pull it and say, well, geez, this was good, but I don't really like this. And I'd like to do my version. And that's great. And that's what you have to do. Yep. I'm going to super chat. TA, thank you. Uh, so is this a OGL product or a standalone LIC? I'm not sure what standalone license maybe. Yeah. So it'll, um, I'll use the creative commons for the, uh, um, for the, the the base rule book and then add and then have a compatibility license for anybody that wants to do their own thing. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again, TA. Boy, I hope uh, you guys are giving money uh, of all nights tonight. I hope uh, you guys have already uh, backed uh, 
the book. This is one night where I don't, I don't want your super chats unless uh, you've already backed uh, Dragon Slayer because that's uh, really where your uh, money should be going. You know, and like I said, we're talking about, um, if I may preach a little bit, you know, we're talking about doing stuff. Try your hand at, at some of this stuff. Try writing, try producing something like i know like that like starfield game came out and it's like i mean i understand you know the the allure of video games and all that but man do do something productive too i mean you don't you don't have to you don't have to log 100 hours of uh, starfield if you devoted uh tw let me 20 hours to just you know doing something you know like you know creating a compatible product you know for greg's game or any other you know osr game um try your hand at it and um see how you do don't waste your time it's uh it's very precious uh, another super chat our old friend emery Kalame. thank you very much i think emery had me he gave me one of my first super chats ever uh the brown sugar cured baked ham golem <laughs> is the most delicious of foes <laughs> do yes. you agree yes it is <laughs> We will nod our heads. You are correct, sir. My, my mouth is watering now. Um, <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to the giants. Oh, we got the storm giant. Oh yeah, yeah, storm giant. They're, to me, they always they're always a little bit more supernatural too, kind of like the fire giant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, man, you throw one of these. They can really mess up a party eight die six damage. <laughs> yep. Yikes. Yeah, catch your uh, buffs before you go into that combat. Yep. You wanted to show the giants? We even get a little bonus here. The the giant ant. Yeah. <laughs> nice. How many monsters uh, did you have total in in your uh, your monster section? Uh, well, it's 40, 45,000 words of monsters. Um, I don't have an exact number off the top of my head, but at, so it, what is, um, just to be clear, so everything that's in a standard um, BX clone in terms of monsters will be uh, in this book. So it, it, this is like, this book has to cover all the basics. So, uh, you know, the cockatrice and the hydra and dragons and um uh giant ants like your standard giant monsters uh, uh monstrous humanoids things like that and then um there if you're looking for a book that has all the monsters from my mega dungeons there's a um mega dungeon monster manual that has all those amalgamated into one which is sitting on my shelf over there. Yeah, that, you guys should pick that up. Um, but yeah, and that just occurred to me. Like, oh yeah, that's if you want your first supplement, you can already get it. Um, yeah, it, it's already available. <laughs> the, the Mega Dungeon Monster Man. It's it's pretty cool. It's got some, it, some really cool off the wall uh, monsters. And if you remember AD and D, the the um, Monster Manual came up first. Yeah, in a way, it's almost a good. It's a good way to do it. It gets it gets your imagination going right away, doesn't it? But but that's that speaks to, and I noticed a few people in your chat have already spoken to it. That because we had basic first, right, and the monster manual came out, we just took the monsters and we incorporated it into the game we were already running. So and then then when the player's handbook and the DM guide came out, and you know we were just young, we're trying to make heads or tails of high guy Gaxian, and as well as all these sort of new weird rules. We're like, no, nah, that doesn't really make any sense. We're just going to keep playing the game we've always been playing, plus monsters, plus classes, plus spells. So I think my generation grew up playing that way. It's just how we play. Yep. Yeah, to some extent, us too. Yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, TA, um, still intent on giving me money, but he's clear. You sold me. Backed. Well, that is great news. Thank you, uh, TA, for the super chat, but also, more importantly tonight, uh, thank you for backing Dragon Slayer. Oh, and we got a yes, little, thank you. we got another one. Alex Clark. How you doing, Alex? Don't know if I've seen you here before. Um, maybe I have. He looks kind of familiar. Loved Duaro Deep. Planning on backing. There you go. Duaro Deep was like my, uh, it's my love letter to, to dwarves. Um, I love playing dwarven fighters, dwarven clerics. That's, that's my jam. And so and I've just, uh, 
they, they, they just, I find them inspiring. Some people are inspired by half orcs and some people are inspired by elves. But for me, it's dwarves. It's kind of like Klingons in, in Star Trek. You know, they're just that yeah. sweet spot. The more Klingons, the better Star Trek is. <laughs> and uh so it's so the more dwarves the better the better you know D is png is always on um like on our house on pluto it's, it's either mst or uh star trek tng and uh i just i couldn't i could there was a couple of klingon those klingon centric episodes and uh, yeah. i just i mean it always amused me how uh they the whole klingon like high council you know they they would always like have to uh they'd have to go to jean-luc picard to settle their stuff it's like it's a it's a, literally a whole planet and it's like all right let's we got to go out to, uh, into space and um you know find uh this one starship with its captain not even like an admiral or anything but uh he had some pull it made for some good episodes though um, yeah. Some of that stuff was pretty good. You had a good question in your chat uh, about how how slayable are dragons, and the answer is <laughs> not very. And as it, as it should be. <laughs> so yeah, so the dragons. I think second edition did a much better job with dragons than first edition did. So my dragons are uh, more like second edition, and I provide um, basic rules on how to scale them backwards or upwards. So the default would be an adult dragon, but you can scale up to great worm or you can scale down to wormling. And I provide a model on how to do that. And in addition to those things, there are additional rules. So if you try to flank a dragon, it can throw its wing out to the side and knock you aside. If you try to attack it from the rear, it can tail slap you. So there's all kinds of additional options to make dragons super badass, which is exactly how they should be in a game called dragon slayer sit down to like the wormlings it just you know it reminded me in the movie mm -hmm. um when he had to kill the little wormlings oh, that's such a cool scene like you know you wouldn't i wonder if you'd even see that nowadays if they'd have the the guts to do that in a big budget movie well that's the awesomeness of the 80s yeah right? it's like yep the baby's got to go too they're just going to grow up and, and be you know what we're dealing with so yeah. Oof, yeah. But that I'm movie had sure. Emperor Palpatine in it, by the way. Yes, I I, I noticed that because it's another one that was that's making the rounds on uh, Pluto. Um, I don't even know why I play. I pay for a Sling TV. We end up watching Pluto TV most of the time. Um, but yeah, Dragon Slayer has been on like a lot. Um, that's why I've I've kind of caught caught it again. And I noticed. I'm like, wait a minute, that's Ian McDiarmid. And uh, yep, sure enough, it. Uh, <laughs> It is. Um, let's see how we're doing, Greg. Shall we? All right. So, like I said, um, we have, uh, looks like, uh, I don't want to take all the credit, but uh, I, I think a lot of it's coming from us. I think we've gotten you a thousand dollars tonight. I think so. Yep. I really appreciate you having me on. It means a lot. And thank you yeah, for your support, yeah. everyone. You guys are great on the chat. These, I tell you what, this these guys and girls, um, man, they kill it. But let's go into the rewards because I, uh, I think you did the right thing by just kind of keeping it uh, cheap, or not cheap, but um, simple. Simple. And in, in my opinion, cheap too, because com compared to what you uh, could pay for some of this stuff. Well, first mm -hmm. of all, we got the PDF. Um, a 300 page, you know, PDF, 35 Canadian, 26 American roughly. Mm -hmm. But then the book and PDF, probably the, uh, you know, that's probably whatever, where everybody's going to go. Um, you know, unless you're, you're on a strict budget, man, $63 for the, uh, for the, this kind of a book and PDF, that's just going to be crammed with this stuff. I mean, Wizards of the Coast will sell you literal shit for the same price shit and then <laughs> it just it, it's it's not even close the value that you're gonna get holy smokes and then um i found this was interesting too and i thought it was a, a very uh good idea for people to get print versions of your mega dungeons if you guys haven't picked up barrow maze and you know dwaro deep or Archaea, or um, Highfell. Um, this is where to do it. 
People kept, I, I never actually thought of that. And it was people that would email me and say, you know, I, I, is there a thing for a, a mega dungeon book or two? Um, because, and I hadn't even thought about it, but now I just add it because it makes a lot of sense and can save a couple bucks. Yeah. yeah that's a good, definitely a, uh, a good idea. <clears throat> um, let's see, I think that was, that's pretty much it, right? Wait, more is more. Pledges for two, oh, two copies. Oh, and somebody go. wanted a, a pledge yeah. for their whole gaming table, so I did yeah. that one too. Yeah, yep, that is smart as well. Yep. Yep, the old uh, six rule books. Yeah, you guys just throw in your money. Um, if you're flush with, uh, you know, with money up front, do it because um, I guess another thing that we haven't uh, talked about is, you know, this, the book's not completely done, but it is mostly done. Is it not? It's 90% done. So but, um, what I'm, so we have to understand, like, so when you, when you, if you don't know, if you submit something to drive through, it can take a week to 10 days to get it approved. And that's assuming it's approved on the first time. Then it, so once it gets approved, then it, ta it can take anywhere from five days to 14 days to get printed. Then you have shipping time, which can be another seven to 10 days. So that's a month. So very shortly, uh, I'm going to start uh, submitting to drive through and it will take me a month to get a print proof. Then I will edit it cover to cover. So then I will make the corrections, then I will submit a new copy and that can then take a month and then I'll get it back and I will do the same thing again. And I will do that every month between now and when it delivers. And uh, because that's how you have to do it to catch, you know, if uh, what I try to do is 3% human error is normal and I'm trying to get it down to less than 1%. And so uh, I take that seriously. It's I do my very best. I'm human, but uh, and I have uh, I send chapters to uh, people I trust that are good, solid proof uh, readers. So you know I do everything I possibly can. But when you add up all those months, it the three or four or five months goes very very quickly. So I have to start doing that now, so that I'll be ready to deliver just into the new year. Yep. Well. Um... As you kind of say, uh, with with confidence, like you know, as far as the risks, you're you're pretty confident. Like, yep, this is going to be done, and it's going to be done on a very uh, fortuitous uh, date, hopefully, uh, provided mm -hmm. everything goes right. Uh, what oh, well. what date is that? <laughs> uh, so, in the Kickstarter, I've got um, March as the delivery date. I'm hopeful to be ahead of that because you know, tw um, 2024 is the 50th anniversary. We want to be gaming hot, like right into the new year and that's that's what i'm aiming for so uh, i'm doing everything i can to be ahead of schedule and having said that i gave myself a little bit of leeway to march but i would anticipate it before then at this time yep. so the the goal is to have it by the time uh, the 50th comes around and um you can celebrate it in style um, in style I, I i would of course never speak for um Obviously, some someone like Gary Gygax, but I I, just, I can't help but think if if Gary was alive, um, he, he would like this. <laughs> um, I think uh, this is spiritually, you know, obviously, um, you know, you know, pretty close to, um, you know, obviously his first two roles, and it's kind of a good amalgamation of them. I think he would applaud uh, this effort absolutely. Well, I, I have nothing but respect um, for Gary Gagax. I treat the mm -hmm. material with respect and um, and I give it everything I've got. And for that reason, because the game is given more to me than I'll ever, ever want to take from the game. Like it was a springboard into higher education. It was a springboard into literacy. It was a springboard into language. It was a springboard into history. And those are all things that are really core to who I am today. And so uh, if I can do something like this and make it fun, make it exciting and get people to play his game, not my game, not Mike Merle's game, not any of these other hacks, his game. And that's what it's about. Yep. I think this is the, uh, I think this is the spiritual inheritor 
I mean, I, I look and I know like OSE is just basic and that's, you know, that's fine. But I mean, this, this just captures this, the spirit and everything uh, from that, that great period of the late seventies, early eighties. Um, there's a, there's a zeitgeist, there's a spirit of the time. And if yes. I can somehow bottle that um, I've, I've succeeded. And it's, I don't know, just, just by kind of what you, what you've said, you know, what you've shown us, um, it is kind of hard to describe to people, but if you were there, you know, and I, w I was there, you know, I was the target market, you know, 1981, you know, kids from, you know, 10 to whatever. Well, you know, I was about 10 in 80, 81. I was, I was lit these games were literally made, you know, for my generation. Um, you know, of course, going forward with everybody, but, uh, you know, I, I do remember that time and just the magic of, you know, just, just seeing this stuff. And I don't know, this just hits me pretty, uh, in, in the in the sweet spot in in the feels yeah um, it does for me too and uh and you know if you're ever that's sometimes you know i so i i print out these sections i put them in a binder and and i i've been proof reading from from that until i submit it for and actually get a print and it's in that context that just flipping through the monster section and looking at some of the art that we've looked at tonight um that that it gives me like some buoyancy. It fills my heart. And I'm like, yeah, uh, this is, this is what it needs to be. And, and then it fires me up to go at it the next day. Yep. Well, is there anything else you wanted to uh, cover maybe before we wrap off? Been going about an hour and a half. That's uh, it's probably about the time we had set for ourselves. Right. Is there anything else you wanted to say to uh, everybody out there? Say anything that we missed? Um, unless there's any kind of final questions, I just want to thank everybody for your support. It means a lot. I, d I never take the support for granted. I'm going to do my very best to bring forward an awesome game that um, will inspire your table for years to come. And hopefully there'll be some people out there who are interested in creating their own stuff and can use this rule set to grow the hobby and uh, get people excited to, to play Gary Gygax's game. To your point, uh, Al Ed says, I got several players who like dwarves. Dwaro D. Hmm, I was thinking <clears throat> Caves of Archaea or Barrow Maze to be the first purchase out of your stuff, but maybe it's Dwaro Deep and Dragon Slayer. Well, I don't know. Uh, if you like dwarves, uh, Dwaro Deep is, or if your players like dwarves, I think Dwaro Deep is, is going gonna, is gonna to be good for them, don't you think, uh, Greg? Oh, for sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, I did a lot of uh, study, you know, to have that uh, dwar I call dwarven geometric uh, aesthetic in, and, and bring that forward. And so you see it repeated in the art. And then if you go back and you take a look at Jeff Easley's cover for Dragon Slayer, when I, when I, um, Jeff and I were going back and forth talking about what we wanted for the cover, I said, it might be, might be kind of fun just to have a little bit of a dwarven geometric arch behind those adventurers as a little tip of the cap to Dwero Deep. And that's exactly what we did. I thought it turned out pretty well. Well, for sure. Yeah, that, that cover is going to uh, that is gonna kick some major ass. Yeah, yeah Chill Gamer lamenting uh, he wanted the, uh, the beacons are lit uh, level. It's all right. Um, you can, th will this? Uh, I guess I want to ask you too. Uh, will this go in in demand then after the uh, after the period? I'm sorry. Um, what do you mean? I mean, it, after 30 days, is is everything cut off, or will you keep it open after? Uh... Well, one of the things that we were talking about in sort of the pre-show is that um, when you when you when you run a Kickstarter, it's like kind of shouting into the void. Like, so you put these things up, and you. You try to let people know, but you don't want to be heavy handed about it either because that just turns people off. And I definitely feel that way. And, mm -hmm. and so at the same time, um, people will come to me like a month after the Kickstarter is over and they'll say, you know, can I can I find a way into it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, just contact me and there's an email at the bottom of the of the Kickstarter page um, and, uh, you know, we can figure figure things out. Okay. Good. Yeah. So honestly, that's, um, that's probably a good, uh, indication though. Um, if you want to make it easy on yourself, um, you know, definitely pledge during the period. Um, I know, you know, you like every Kickstarter, you know, you start out good, 
you end good and then there's that kind of lull in the middle that's right you know if you're if you're if you're going to be jammed up with something you know on or around you know the end of uh september just don't be afraid to back in the middle just you know kind of safely secure it without uh you know having to uh to hassle anybody um looks like noi jitat picked it up along with barrow maze you are uh going to love barrow maze and uh, i have a feeling you're going to like this when it comes out too just kind of trolling the chats here usually i got my buddy crazy mouse doing this but i wanted to see if um there was any uh kind of lingering uh major questions um i think i think we got to basically uh you know every every major um you know question or concern um oops hold on here we got a uh if mouse were here he called a mouse dropping uh greg thanks for making gaming materials for people who love these games and the history of this hobby here's to crits and ham golems <laughs> and shittens yes crits ham golems and shittens and and so, blutter and blutterflies <laughs> so that i feel that's a, so a little bit of an inside joke so i'll tell you that one quick so my uh I always have a, an eye out for uh, or an ear uh, to the ground for interesting monster names. And my daughter uh, at one point um, went to say, oh, there's a butterfly. And it came out a blutterfly. And I'm like, <laughs> yoink, that's that's a monster. Taken. And so it's in the, the Mega Dungeon Monster Manual, the blutterfly. That's a little bit of inside information for you. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, I think uh, we've had a good go of it tonight. Kept it a nice, tight uh, hour and a half. We uh, pretty much stayed on point. Um, unfortunately, it looks like James couldn't make it in. Um, you know, we'll try to get him on uh, very, very soon. Um, but, um, hey, guys, I have the uh, link in the description. I will uh, put it, see if I... Uh, Put it, yep, I'm putting it in the chat one last time here. Um, you know, if you're uh, on the fence, um, you know, I hope you uh, consider everything Greg said. Um, he's one of us. He's one of the good ones. Um, isn't afraid to call out, you know, all the nonsense happening in the uh, industry right now, but um, just doing it in a very classic and classy way um, with his rules. So um, please consider uh, supporting dragon slayer all right well if uh that's all greg um we will uh, wrap it up that chat thank you so much for coming out tonight um you guys uh have a uh, great rest of your night greg stick around for a second we'll talk after the uh, outro uh have you seen the uh ronnie james dio thing i did, did i did see yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I won't play. I, I just played it last night. So um, most everybody here has, uh, has already seen it. So every Heck time yeah. I do that, it, it gets demonetized, uh, which doesn't matter for a, uh, a live stream, you know, it's a, you don't make any ad revenue anyway, but I also don't want to, uh, I don't want to hit people over the head with it either. So, um, all right. Um, you guys take care. Um, hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday. I don't know, th three streams in five days. I don't know. Maybe I'll need an extra week off, but uh, who knows? Uh, well, I'll probably be back next Wednesday. So um, maybe we'll sneak a video in between. Um, but for uh, that'll do it for Greg Gillespie, the great Dr. Greg Gillespie. I'm your humble host, Double D. You guys take care and have a great, great rest of the night. Hang around, Greg, uh, and uh, we will talk. Bye, guys. Cheers. Hey man, is that Double D? Yeah man, well turn it up man! Let's just go in and like, kill all the orcs, right? They're the bad guys, who gives a shit? We just hack and slash and we loot their dead bodies, right? Hack and slash, kill them all, you know, conquer the infidels. Boy, that campaign sounds like a barrel of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> I am Pardieu, I am a holy man. I'm the king of France. Your majesty. Somebody who's who's opening a refrigerator and leaning in, right, is the language of a woman. Somebody who's opening their refrigerator and being cut off halfway through that lean is the voice of a, like a mermaid or a siren. Right? Zardoz speaks to you. This is not the face of the hobby anymore. Uh, and I think there's been mistakes made in years past where people assumed that D&D &D players were all, you know, 
white dudes in a basement, um, which is which has been a faulty assumption for a lot of years and gets more and more false every day. Uh, and so it's in my viewpoint, honestly, guys like me can't can't leave soon enough. We gotta put a little hot sauce on the taco, you know what I mean? We want this dwarf to be the dwarfiest dwarf. Right, right, right. We right. want the elf to be the elfiest elf. And just the dashiest dash of Tabasco. Their voices need to carry across water. I'm a creative. Um, it's a huge drain, right? Because fans can be awful. Rapido, right foot to the bar! <laughs> <laughs> When you say white lives matter, they don't. White lives don't matter because white lives aren't a thing. I disagree. I disagree, Gary. Lutherville, Marina Del X, Otisburg. Otisburg? Who's this monster? She's got her own place. Man. Otisburg? It's a little bitty place. Otisburg? Okay, I just... Wipe it off. That's all. It's a little town. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Fucking thing sucks. In five, four, three. Great. Great sandwich. Thank you. I enjoyed having you here. You're a very good co-host.